Okay, just uh, okay. You already said almost everything. So usually I use this slide uh, because I'm a fake Veneto person because uh, the surname is from uh, is a classical uh, uh, Balan is a super classical in Padua, but I have an accent. I'm from Florence originally, and in the meantime, yeah, I spent some time in Stanford working with uh, Fefe Lee and, Sam and uh, Silvio Savarese, and since late 2017, I started my own group in uh, Padua, and this are the picture of all the members. And we are mostly working on, on computer vision uh, uh, problems, uh, as uh, I'll try to briefly highlight at the very beginning. So hopefully this is not going to be too much introductory, but I'd like to give you a quick overview about all the things that you, you are uh, interested in. OK, so my ba background, uh, really in one slide uh, at the very high level. Uh, so my, I, mean, I worked on several things, uh, but Basically, all of them are related to visual recognition problems. And really, in just one slide, uh, and obviously, nowadays, this means uh, that we are uh, dealing with some machine learning model in order to uh, teach machines to see. Uh, so this means that, obviously, we are interested in very classical problems, sub such as image understanding, like uh, uh, classification, object detection, uh, segmentation. And so these are the output that you would expect to get from this model, so like person, bench, carousel, and stuff like that. But we are also interested in specific instances of objects. So for a while, I worked a lot on image retrieval tasks. And actually, uh, we are also interested in dynamic concepts. So uh, not only the static object, uh, but obviously also uh, actions, activities, and stuff like that. And nowadays, uh, everything is working uh, relatively well because of deep learning, right? So uh, this is to say, so we are all super familiar with this, but let's start then with uh, the two major questions that we are trying uh, partially to tackle. And first of all, let me introduce this uh, uh, more realistic scenario in which uh, uh, most of the things that I highlighted in the previous slide, uh, let's say, are based on the assumption that you have uh, a large scale data set uh, that can be used, uh, such as ImageNet, in order to train your model. But actually, uh, in the real world, uh, uh, this scenario is not really realistic, right? Because, I mean, uh, usually you have the long tail problem. So there are very few con uh, context uh, scenarios uh, in which you have access to large scale data set of annotated data. And, but even if you are Google, and uh, let's assume that you can have access to all the data that you want, and you have also a lot of money uh, to annotate the, the data, uh, the problem is that, uh, I mean, there are concepts that are not so frequent, right? So let's use the uh, web scenario as the main scenario. And so even if you are Google, maybe you have a lot of uh, samples of cats, right? This is the, probably the most uh, uh, frequent class uh, over the web. But then uh, there are very few samples or of uh, weird animals such as this Patagonia Mara. So even if you have a lot of uh, resources, uh, uh, the problem is that, uh, uh, I mean, the real world is unbalanced, right? So the first question then is that we are partially trying to tackle is uh, how to scale up our models uh, to very large vocabularies in which it is very hard uh, to collect uh, or hard uh, to collect ground to truth data. So that's the first, let's say, uh, let's say research question. And then the second one, uh, again, uh, talking about the how realistic or not realistic is the, uh, the scenario. Uh, another important aspect uh, is that even humans, uh, and here I'm referring to the standard visual recognition tasks, so just that kind of tasks, uh, even in that setting, uh, humans uh, actually don't follow the standard uh, fully supervised paradigm that uh, our models are, uh, I mean, are following. So even for visual recognition problems, uh, usually, there is, let's say, at least in part, uh, uh, the agent, the human or the animal, it's usually actively participating to the context, so interacting with the context. And this is the embodied part of the, of the talk. So what, especially recently, we are trying to tackle problems in which, uh, uh, let's say, the emphasis is on this aspect. So how to uh, mimic uh, this paradigm in which uh, uh, the agent uh, our algorithm, our model, is able to interact uh, to the sur with the surrounding. Uh, OK, so this is, let's say, the underlying, uh, the underlying major questions that we, are that, that we are interested in. And 
related to this, uh, in really five slides, uh, I'll try to highlight uh, the major research directions that we are uh, following. So the first one, uh, again, uh, talking about the standard fully supervised paradigm. So first of all, uh, we tried to introduce models uh, that are, let's say, first of all, working in an incremental or continual learning way. So the first thing that we are trying to do is to design models such as this one. This is a recent work that we presented at ICCV a couple of years ago, in which here we are uh, focusing on the idea of uh, having a model that is able, at test time, uh, to recognize classes that are not available at training time. And this is, depending on the context, this sometimes is called uh, open set, open word recognition, uh, novel class discovery. This is a classical task in continual learning. So here, the incremental part is the, is the number of classes. Again, trying to go uh, again uh, beyond full supervision, uh, another research direction that, uh, especially with one uh, mas uh, master student at the beginning and now PhD student, uh, we are working on self-supervised learning models, uh, in particular trying to exploit uh, uh, underlying properties that are usually available in images. So for example, uh, relations uh, between patches uh, that can be exploited in order to uh, use this information uh, like a loose form of supervision. And so this is a recent work in which we are in particular focusing in, uh, on visual transformer. We are trying to introduce some tasks uh, in order to remove the uh, supervision and to learn for representation learning, basically. Then the second, yeah, yeah, sure. The first one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So this is actually this is a mess because depending on the, uh, I mean, there are two, three different tasks uh, in which you are basically doing the same stuff uh, that are called in a different way. Depending on the community that started to work on this. So usually in the, I mean, if you are more on the classical uh, core machine learning side, this is basically one classical task in continual learning. In computer vision, this is usually called novel class discovery or open set recognition, but there are minor differences, but at the end, the setting is the one, the, simple, the, the simplest one is the one in which you have n classes at training time, uh, and then at test time, uh, you have n plus one, or n plus two, n plus k. So obviously, so basically at test time is uh, something in between uh, a fully supervised approach uh, plus uh, the unsupervised learning part, in which you have to understand that the run, I mean, the is basically an anomaly, should be uh, treated as a new class. So basically, this is the task. Then the second, the second direction uh, is at the intersection between uh, vision and language. And here, in particular, we are doing a couple of things, especially in collaboration with uh, Fondazione Bruno Kessler in Trento. And here is just an example in which uh, uh, we are trying to align, uh, in a weekly supervised setting, uh, captions. Uh, to the visual counterpart. So the colors here refers to the fact that, uh, again, in a weekly supervised setting, you try to understand that part of the caption, uh, which part of the caption, so on the NLP side, this is name entities recognition, name entities recognition, this red part should be aligned with the output of an object detector in which you detect airplanes, and so on. And the same applies also here. Then, third major directions, here we are actually uh, working a lot uh, is actual rec I mean, related to action recognition. But in particular, we're interested in predictive tasks. So uh, here we did a couple of things. Uh, uh, again, just uh, uh, some pointers. Uh, one major thing that we are doing now is uh, uh, related to action anticipation. So basically here, the task is to recognize action, especially, and this is what is more interesting to us, uh, especially in a setting in which you have uh, a large vocabulary of actions, such as the one, if you are familiar with the data set that you have in Epic Kitchens, that I don't like the scenario because this is, uh, I mean, collected on the kitchens. But the interesting thing is that since uh, these are instru uh, basically instructional video, so you have a protocol to follow, you have a lot of actions or sub-actions uh, that are, uh, all of them are related to each other. And in general, in actions, I mean, in video understanding, this is not always true. So it's not easy to 
I mean, it's not always the case that one action is uh, uh, highly uh, correlated to another action, especially in, in a short uh, uh, time window. And so what we are doing here is that taking into account, uh, the, let's say, the current action and maybe the previous one, we would like to infer and to predict uh, the most likely next action. And this is interesting. Uh, I mean, the applications here are in all domains uh, in which uh, you have some form of interaction. So for example, human-robot interaction, if you want to have a natural interaction with the robot or with an autonomous agent, you should anticipate the next action. And partially related to this, uh, uh, trajectory for forecasting or tra trajectory prediction, that is a specific task uh, in which, uh, uh, and I'll talk about this later on, uh, in which basically the setting is the following. So this is a particular case of time series prediction, in which in this particular case, uh, you are observed at training time, uh, you have a sequence, uh, like 20 steps, uh, corresponding to uh, usually pedestrian in a urban scenario or cars or stuff like that. So this could be the output of a vis visual tracker. And what you want to do here is to, at training time, you learn the behavior. And then at test time, uh, using just a portion of the trajectory of the time, seri time series, then you try to predict, uh, to infer uh, the final part. So the standard setting in the common benchmarks is the following. So you observe eight time steps, and then you want to predict the next 12 t time steps. And here we did several things, uh, uh, but I'll talk about this uh, uh, in the first part of the talk later on. And then finally, uh, embodied visual navigation, in which there is this embodied part that I was referring to at the very beginning. And so this is something that we started really recently. And here, the, uh, I mean, this is partially related to robotics. Uh, but uh, uh, we are interested, I mean, uh, we are dealing uh, only with the vision and machine learning part. Uh, and the context here is basically the following. So usually you have uh, simulators uh, in computer graphics, so like uh, video games, basically. And what you can do, but the nice thing is that you have this large, uh, uh, I mean, uh, scenario with many buildings, uh, like the one that you can have, uh, uh, like in Google Street View, but inside a uh, house or, or uh, offices or, or stuff like that. And what you can do with the simulator is, is to simulate the real behavior that you will have access to if you have a real robot, like Roomba, basically. And what you want to do is to solve uh, complex tasks. The nice thing is that you can do this uh, even if you don't have the real robot, and you have a lot of data to train your models uh, and stuff like that. So the talk uh, will be focused on these two last parts. Uh, Yeah, I'll talk about this uh, later on more in details. Uh, but yeah, the, basically, the, the simulator is giving you, basically, you have the same kind of interaction uh, that you have uh, with Google Maps. So if you go, uh, if you run Google Maps uh, in Street View mode, uh, so you can move, uh, right, in the, real, in the real scenario, and you get the output. So you can move, like, 20 centimeters or stuff like that, and then you'll get uh, the image that you were supposed to observe in that specific location. And so this is what you can do here. Actually, you don't have just the RGB image, but you have the RGB, the depth, uh, and other sensors. So the same kind of input, and you can also change the uh, field of view. So you can move the camera. So you can simulate the same, uh, the real setting that the robot, uh, such as that one, basically like Roomba, would have in the same setting. And so you can really simulate. Obviously, it's not exactly the same thing, because the image that you get, uh, so the quality of the RGB image, uh, it's not the same, it's less than the one that you could get with the, I mean, with the real, uh, real robot. But on the other hand, uh, you don't have all the problems uh, that you have with the real robot. So like, uh, I mean, the, the low-level uh, uh, robotics problem. So you are basically removing all the kind of things, and you can really focus on just the uh, visual navigation problems. But I'll talk about this uh, uh, later on. OK, so let's start with the first one. So uh, as I said, uh, one first measure direction that we actually, I worked with on this for some years now, because I started when I was at Stanford. So here, the goal, as I said previously, is to try to predict, to, in, to infer the behavior of humans or generic agents, uh, agents uh, in a way that is, uh, I mean, ideally, you would like to take into account uh, 
all the different ingredients that can be used in order to predict the behavior. And so, as I said, the, the, at the very high level, then the task is the following. So uh, you have, let's assume, in the, very, uh, in the, mo in the most uh, difficult scenario, you would like to have uh, a model that is able, on a new scene, uh, to predict uh, the most likely behaviors of any agent. And in our view, this, again, can be related to many applications. So again, robotics, uh, sports video analysis, uh, retails, uh, and stuff like that. In all those scenarios, at the end, the behaviors of human or agents, autonomous agents, can be described, especially in the short term, as a trajectory. And the first uh, idea that we tackled uh, a few years ago, or let's say that the main goal uh, at the very beginning was the following. So again, uh, related to the uh, data notation problem. So obviously, in a scenario such as this one, uh, if you remember what I said at the very beginning, uh, so you are assuming that to have access to many trajectories of behaviors in order to learn the uh, behavior of any agent. Uh, and obviously, to annotate a data such as this one is a nightmare, right? And actually, this is what we did when I was at Stanford. So uh, we, there are still other data sets. Uh, but one of the major goals that we had uh, at the very beginning was to try to have uh, a new data set in which you can tackle these kind of problems. So we started to annotate uh, what is called now Stanford drone data set. Uh, in which you have plenty of scenes, uh, I mean, not really plenty, but a lot of scenes, uh, you, uh, and we use the drone to do that. So the view is the top view. And what we did is to, we annotated the data set, uh, starting from the output of, uh, of a visual tracker. And here, uh, so one of the first goal, uh, and actually this is, at the end, it didn't end very well, uh, was to have also a data set uh, that is multi-class. So we tried to have uh, in the same scene, so same scenario, and this is basically campus, uh, the Stanford campus. So we collected uh, statistics about different classes. So basically pedestrians, uh, cars, uh, bicycles, and all the things that can move in Stanford, uh, at Stanford. The problem is that in the campus, you have only humans, humans and bicycles. So at the end, uh, the multi-class aspect of the data is just two classes. But besides that, uh, uh, again, this is at least more uh, realistic than the standard data sets uh, that are usually related to video surveillance. And what we tried at the beginning is to uh, introduce a model uh, that is also exploiting some knowledge transfer uh, capability. So the idea, especially at the beginning, was to, OK, let's assume that I have a relatively small data set with full annotation. And then uh, I would like to scale the models that are learned in this, set, in this setting on Google Street View, basically. And the way we try to tackle this, this problem is basically the following. Uh, I'll go faster, uh, but some of the ideas that we introduced at that time are used also in some of the uh, works that we did recently. So the first idea is that is this abstraction in which we have uh, a navigation map. So basically, the idea here is to collect some statistics uh, about the behaviors uh, of uh, any possible uh, uh, agent, autonomous agent. And as I said, mostly in this context means uh, bicycle and pedestrian. And in this work, uh, in particular, we used uh, these three different information. So first of all, what we call at the time uh, popularity map. Uh, that is, this is a training time. So this is just a statistics. So as you can see here, uh, basically you have the red part uh, means that this is, these are locations in which it's very likely to find a pedestrian or a cyclist actually in this case. The second image uh, refers to what we call the uh, routing map. So basically here, the the red parts uh, correspond to ro locations uh, in which it's very likely that a bicycle or a pedestrian is going to change uh, suddenly the behavior. And then we have some statistics uh, and features uh, uh, that are really built on top of the, basically on the trajectory. Then uh, using this information, so this is basically a source of information that we can use uh, in order to build uh, our uh, prediction model that at the end, uh, in this first work, uh, uh, was a very simple dynamic Bayesian network uh, that, given the trajectory, so at the end, uh, each, I mean, the sequence uh, is basically a sequence of steps uh, in which uh, each step uh, corresponds to the location in space. And the idea is that, uh, I mean, I, I'm not going into the details, but the goal uh, is to use not only the trajectory information, but the trajectory plus uh, the information that is uh, encoded in the, in the map in order to provide uh, prior, basically, prior information to the model. Okay, let's go faster. 
then you my, my task uh, where where is the uh, knowledge transfer part well here the idea is the following so what i just briefly described is the underlying idea of the model then uh, what we try to do is to at that time uh, to use standard techniques uh, mostly based on uh, mm, local features uh, computed on the output of an image segmentation module in order to transfer so the first row here uh, corresponds to the standard setting in which i have all the training data then in the second row you have an hallucinated image uh, that is actually obtained uh, transferring patches uh, the closest patches uh, in terms of uh, semantic descriptors uh, that are then likely to share the same uh, statistics and this is actually what i know if the overall is clear so at the end uh, by doing that uh, what you are transferring uh, this is just uh, for visualization purposes just to see if we are transferring uh, patches that correspond to similar scenarios but the idea is that at the end uh, if i collect those information in a scene with a similar pattern so like a roundabout with uh, a building and stuff like that it's likely that the behavior on the same context will be similar and this is actually and then we will transfer the corresponding information in terms of as i said popularity and, uh, and uh, routine maps and this is actually what you'll get obviously it's super noisy but the nice thing is that by even by doing that uh, you'll get a model such as this one so at the end this is a probab probabilistic model so what you are really learning is a i mean probability in space uh, but on top of that uh, you can predict uh, the uh, most likely trajectory and here is just a visualization on one specific scene of what you'll get. Yeah. Yeah. Between the patches. No global. This is just patches. Yeah, and, ob and this is the reason why this is actually super noisy. Then overall, uh, you, as you can see here, for example. So this means that locally, this patch, uh, I mean, obviously, close by patches, uh, probably are described uh, yeah, in a very similar way so you are going to transfer very similar but this is not actually always the case as you can see like here and obviously there are uh, i mean scenes in which uh, this is not super uh, i mean characteristics and so you will not expect to get uh, i mean very uh, good information from that so this was the original idea then on top of that uh, uh, i mean for a couple of years uh, we introduced a lot of models uh, that are sharing uh, some of the same ideas in a completely different context. Uh, so this is the first work uh, in which basically we did the same uh, using uh, uh, recurrent neural network. So in particular here we are extending another work that is called social STM, in which I'm going fast here. Maybe if you're interested, we can talk about this uh, offline. And so here is the same idea, but now the model, uh, I mean, is based on LSTMs. Uh, so you have a component, the one in the middle, that is the same that I described previously plus uh, contextual descriptors that again are obtained uh, after uh, segmentation and then everything is merged all together by a uh, recurrent neural network like GRUs or LSTMs. Then uh, this is another work that we did uh, a couple of years ago together with uh, uh, Modena, with uh, Cucchiara's group, uh, in which we are doing the same but now we have also a more fancy way to uh, describe the context, so contextual features. Uh, and this is based on uh, graph neural network. So now, instead of having just patches uh, in which you have, you are building some descriptors, here we have also an explicit, uh, explicit relations between uh, elements of the scene and also uh, other pedestrians. And finally, this is the last thing that we actually are working on uh, lately. Again, this is a model uh, now based on transformers uh, in which uh, uh, actually here we have also an additional model let's go here so the part on top uh, besides the specific way we are uh, modeling the uh, everything uh, uh, again we have a temporal backbone that is doing so trying to solve the same task uh, plus uh, another module that is called here goal module in which we are trying also to infer another additional information that is related to the final destination so here the idea is that we have first of all uh, a module uh, that is predicting uh, the most likely goal uh, or goals uh, because actually it's very likely that uh, you it might be that you have multiple targets uh, and then we will use this even if it is noisy we will use this information as a prior in order to uh, again uh, uh, i mean to influence uh, uh, the prediction 
This obviously, if the goal module works uh, reasonably well, uh, so then this is basically doing the same stuff that we did previously. Here we have also semantic features, and then we have the, this last model. By doing that, uh, I don't want to, I mean, these are all the standard benchmarks, and we are doing well. No, not, uh, I mean, we are not really state of the art because this is a super crowded, uh, uh, I mean, uh, scenario, but we are on par uh, with uh, another model that actually did more or less with a completely different uh, approach, but they did something very similar. And this is the Jitendra Malik's, uh, from Jitendra Malik's group. But again, this is just to say that we did several things uh, with different models, uh, but it's something that we are still uh, working on, uh, in particular in uh, for long-term prediction. Because the standard data sets, uh, one of the major problems here, uh, here, these are the standard data sets that I referred to previously. Here, this is the prediction is really short term. So 30 steps uh, means that you are predicting uh, what is going to happen in three seconds. So what we would like to do is the same stuff uh, in relatively long term. So these settings that is less po popular is the setting in which you are trying to solve the same stuff, but now the final destination is in 15, even 20 seconds. So this is really far away. Obviously, this is super challenging, and in particular, if you try to predict uh, the behavior at, at long term, uh, it's more likely that you have uh, multiple targets. So, the, the, I mean, the future is multi, you have multi future problems, basically. So, this is the first, uh, uh, the first thing that I wanted to briefly highlight. So, many different ways uh, to try to tackle the same problem that is the problem of trying to infer to predict the behaviors at short or long term especially using uh, uh, contextual information coming from the scene or the behaviors of, uh, of other agents. And this is partially related also to the second task and to the major things that I wanted to describe, uh, that is the following. And here I'm really highlighting in particular one work uh, that is an, uh, I mean, uh, actually we just submitted this. Uh, uh, and this is a, a work that we are doing in collaboration with, again, with FBK and uh, Simon Fraser University. And they are super active in these embodied uh, navigation uh, problems. So what we are doing here is to try to introduce also a slightly novel task. Uh, and I'll, in a few slides, uh, I'll try to describe this more in detail. But first of all, let me spend now uh, a couple of slides uh, to describe uh, more in details uh, what is this embodied AI that I'm referring to. Well, again, the standard setting, uh, this is the standard computer vision setting. So the one that I referred to in all the previous examples. So this could be the case of, uh, I mean, the input could be an image or a video, but usually the output, uh, the expected output, uh, is always uh, something that is obtained, uh, basically defining a classification of a regression model. And so this could be the case of, uh, I mean, a label, a class, uh, a bounding box, uh, a mask, uh, or trajectories, like in the previous case. But in all those scenarios, uh, uh, these are basically the thing that you expect to get as an output. So even if it is fancy, this is fundamentally a static scenario. Okay, so you are not, uh, you have a super fancy model that is not uh, uh, changing the behavior depending on what's happening around the, uh, uh, I mean, uh, around the object of interest. So what is then embodied AI? Well, embodied AI is a setting in which uh, we don't have just an agent, an algorithm, but this agent and algorithm is supposed to live in a real or realistic scenario in which it can explore uh, and navigate uh, the scene in a way that uh, uh, can change the, behav the behavior of the model itself. So technically, this means that usually we are going to use uh, reinforcement learning models or deep reinforcement learning nowadays. Uh, and these settings, uh, especially to us, uh, and embodied AI in this particular context uh, is usually referring to, robo to robots at the end. So the tasks uh, that you are referring to are tasks uh, in which you have an agent, an autonomous agent, that at the end is basically a robot. So the robot and so the tasks that you are referring to are tasks, uh, are navigation tasks. Okay? So this robot, uh, like in the previous slide that we saw uh, a few minutes ago, so this is going to be our agent uh, that can interact with the uh, environment using uh, different sensor, sensors, uh, and these are mostly RGB and depth cameras, uh, plus uh, other things such as, uh, I mean, other uh, standard uh, things like uh, uh, GPS uh, sometimes or stuff like that. 
And this is just in terms of uh, advertising. Uh, this is a workshop that is running. Uh, uh, now it's the fifth edition. Uh, that is, uh, an, I mean, this is a huge thing because there are super important players that are, uh, I mean, introducing stuff here. And this year we will have the fifth uh, uh, edition with many different challenges and benchmarks. Here, I summarize just a major one, just to give you an idea of how big is the stuff. Uh, so first of all, uh, in order to do what I just described, uh, you need three major components. So first of all, uh, I mean, obviously you have to define the tasks, uh, but I'll talk about this later on. Uh, and these are, so there are different standard tasks uh, that are defined uh, in which usually you have an increasing level of complexity. Then you have, and this is a huge problem, uh, I mean, a, a huge thing, uh, you need to have simulators in which you can run all this stuff. Uh, and this is a mess because still a couple of years ago, we had uh, different simulators. Uh, then uh, Facebook Air Search uh, tried to uh, put all these things uh, under the same umbrella that is called Habitat, in which you have uh, basically a standard platform uh, with APIs uh, that you can use in order to support all most of the uh, efforts that have been uh, introduced in the last year by different peoples. Uh, and another important one is Gibson, by, again, by Stanford. And then you have obviously the data sets. And the most important uh, focusing on is Matterport 3D in which uh, of uh, uh, many buildings, usually using SLAM. So in order to, I mean, to deal with this stuff, you need all those three components. And the common setting, just to be a little bit more concrete. Uh, so here, uh, and also trying to describe the task that we'll try to solve then. Uh, so the common setting in this scenario then is to have, uh, I mean, this robot uh, that is then moving I in this scenario. And the fact that the robot moves uh, means that uh, he is taking a step uh, that in this specific scenario means that you are going to move forward uh, by standard amount of centimeters, 25. Then you can turn left, turn right, and stop. An episode is the instance. Uh, is the, I mean, basically here by a an episode, we define one single instance. Uh, and this means that uh, this is a sequence of actions, uh, so a sequence of actions such as this one, until uh, the stop action. And then you have all the previous uh, I mean, input, uh, plus GPS, compass, sensors, and so on. So basically, you take those information, then you learn a policy, so a sequence of actions such as this one, uh, trying to solve one specific goal. And what are the goals? Uh, here you have uh, summarized uh, the three major tasks uh, that are usual, usually defined uh, in this specific scenario. So the first one, uh, the simplest one, uh, is point call navigation. So here uh, the assumption is that uh, uh, you start uh, at a random location. This is the first uh, step uh, of an episode. Then uh, if the goal is point call navigation, I mean, if the task is point call navigation, then uh, the, the target uh, is defined by a specific given coordinate. Then you have the second task uh, that is called object goal navigation, in which basically you are trying to do the same, uh, but now the goal is not anymore a coordinate, uh, but is an object distance of one specific class. And here you have a vocabulary, a small vocabulary of 20 classes, uh, and this corresponds to objects that you can find in a building or uh, in an office, such as. And so here uh, it means that uh, I'm able to starting from a random uh, position to reach the a destination in which you can recognize that specific object, uh, object. Then, and this is the third one, vision and language navigation, that is basically the same stuff, uh, but now you have an additional complexity that is coming from the fact that, first of all, uh, the goal uh, is ex expressed uh, in terms of uh, with a short sentence, uh, so we have also the NLP part, uh, but this is actually not the real, uh, the real problem. The nice thing is that the fact that you have this uh, caption, uh, and this is similar if you are familiar with this kind of problems, this is basically very similar to what you have in visual question answering problems. Uh, so the fact that now you have a, an instruction in NLP, this means that you have also a goal uh, that can be more complex uh, also in terms of uh, uh, vision capabilities. So this could be, for example, it's not anymore a bottle, but the goal could be something like, uh, I don't know, the bottle in the kitchen on the right of the window. So this means that you have to understand, I mean, the sentence, uh, but also you have to 
I mean, the model should be able to understand, uh, I mean, spatial relation between objects, uh, the fact that uh, an object is very likely to be in one room in, instead of in, in, or in another, and so on. Okay. Okay, so this is really in a nutshell what we want to do. And here you have some examples. So uh, this is, for example, object group navigation. This is the input. Uh, and at the end, uh, your algorithm is going to do something like that. So it's building uh, a map uh, in which, uh, starting from this location, is exploring this, the scene, uh, trying to find uh, the specific instance of the object that you're interested in. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, that, that's one of the, even if it is fancy, that is actually the, one of the main problems. I mean, uh, this is st static, uh, first of all, uh, because actually there are other tasks that uh, have been introduced, like uh, in which, for example, you can uh, move objects. So you can simulate also the scenario in which uh, uh, there are active agents, humans, that are changing at least partially the behavior. But then, and this is the main emphasis of our work, uh, these are the metrics, but I'll go later on. So, uh, okay, no, I have to skip too, too much. Thing. Then uh, the second m major missing point uh, uh, part here are the humans. As, and this is actually the main emphasis of what we are doing. So we are trying to introduce a new task. We are not actually the first one, but we are trying to scale this to a more realistic uh, scale. So introducing social navigation, in which uh, now in the same scene, you have also humans and this here there is an intersection with the trajectory stuff that I presented previously because this means that now you have at the end uh, what you are trying to learn here is a trajectory so if this is path planning at the end if you have also humans moving uh, you have also to avoid the uh, I mean the humans that are moving the same uh, the same scenario and this is actually the main contribution of the work that uh, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm introducing now but before going there, so what is our, I mean, the way this stuff is uh, evaluated is usually using th those metrics. Uh, so basically success rates uh, that m measure just the ratio of uh, given an, ep the, uh, an episode, uh, this is a success if starting from the random location, you can reach the final destination. So if this is object goal navigation, this means that you can recognize the object uh, and you can reach the, the, uh, the, real, uh, I mean, the real point in, in space. Then you have SPL. Uh, in which you are actually uh, measuring also the, the trajectory. So this means that, I mean, an episode could be could end well, but uh, you can, it can take forever to reach the final destination. So SPL is me measuring how optimal is the path uh, that you are uh, following in order to reach your final destination. So what then the fa uh, so what we did uh, in this in this context then so the first uh, uh, major contribution our first major contribution is uh, uh, let's uh, that in the last couple of years uh, tried uh, to uh, use uh, semantic maps uh, in order to uh, build uh, an effective uh, uh, path planning strategy and these are a couple of examples so this is the first wo first work uh, in which basically we are this is, these are doing uh, a very similar thing of, uh, uh, to what i described briefly for trajectory prediction so basically here you try online to build a semantic map uh, like what roomba did uh, do but now the map uh, is not just uh, uh, i mean object uh, not object uh, but here you also try to understand uh, the semantic elements because obviously if you want to find an object, uh, if you understand that this is a sofa, this is giving you an important information uh, in, if you want to recognize, uh, to find a pillow, for example, and so on. In these two models, what they're doing is to build a, a path planning scheme uh, that is uh, exploiting uh, using different models, but at the end this idea. So basically they have semantic maps uh, in which uh, then you can save and reuse uh, the map uh, in order to build uh, a path a good uh, planning strategy. What we tried to do is to, following this, this same uh, this, uh, this direction, uh, we try to build a model uh, in which we can uh, explicitly inject uh, some semantic information, uh, so basically prior knowledge, uh, using uh, different ways. Uh, and in particular here, what we are doing uh, is Let's, let's start with this. Uh, so the first idea is the following. So let's try to build a knowledge base, uh, basically, in which uh, that can be exploited uh, by combining uh, two different behaviors. 
So basically, we will have a policy that is basically a navigation policy that is used uh, if you don't have any knowledge about the surrounding. So for example, this is the robot, the first time that it observed a scene, like Roomba the first time that uh, entered a room. So at the beginning, is basically exploring, building the map. And if the target, like here is like, so object goal navigation is, where is the oven? So at the beginning, uh, what it's trying to do, it is trying to do is to accumulate knowledge uh, in order to understand uh, what is the surrounding. Then eventually it can exploit this knowledge uh, in a similar room uh, or in a second, uh, let's say, later on. And how we collect this? Uh, well, we have many components. So for example, we recognize objects, uh, we do image segmentation, uh, we store all this information, and this is done in a semi-symbolic way using at the end a sort of find automata that is in which uh, uh, we have uh, information about objects uh, elements of the scene uh, and uh, the relation between those objects and the policy and the main contribution here is that uh, what we are doing we are trying to do this uh, in a setting in which you can reuse information the problem here, uh, maybe this is a bit technical, but uh, the problem is, and this is one of our main criticisms to this stuff, uh, is that in all the tasks that I introduced previously, the assumption is that at every iteration you have zero memory. That is obviously not uh, a realistic assumption. So what we are doing here is that we are also trying to introduce a setting in which you can reuse uh, uh, prior inf at least uh, prior information. So you have a sort of a memory. In particular, in this setting, having a symbolic way of representing the, uh, I mean, the scene uh, is helping a lot. Because then you can, if you recognize that this is a kitchen, then if you already observe kitchens, maybe you can reuse the same sort of information. And this is what ha what's happening here. So for example, here, basically what we are doing is, to, if we are in a setting that we have been already observed, like have I already been here, so is this a room that I have observed even in other scenes, uh, then you can try to use uh, the prior knowledge that is embedded in, the, uh, in your semantic map. And this is what, uh, at the very high level, this is what we are doing. So basically, we have uh, two policies. So we have a first phase in which we are doing knowledge extraction. So basically, this is uh, just ex we are exploring the scene. Then we accumulate knowledge in this abstract model. That is the knowledge base that is supposed to accumulate all the, uh, all the knowledge. And then, uh, in real time, uh, we switch between the pri if the new knowledge, so what the robot observes, uh, is, let's say, close enough to something that has been already stored in the, in the, uh, in the knowledge base, uh, then uh, we will use that information. If not, uh, we update the module, the abstract model, with new knowledge. And so by doing that, uh, we optimize. Uh, so the goal of the policy is to optimize, uh, in, on one hand, uh, the navigation capabilities, so acquiring new, no, uh, acquiring new knowledge, or to reuse them in a similar setting. What is? Here we are using diff okay. We are using different things. Uh, once done, here actually there is a mix. Uh, maybe later on, if you want, I can give more details. Uh, here we can, since we have a relatively symbolic setting. Uh, we can also use uh, standard path planners, uh, like the one that you have uh, for, uh, for real, real path planning. Or you can use uh, what is usually the standard setting in our area that is more uh, deep learning based, uh, so more data driven. Like, for example, the standard way using deep reinforcement, lear uh, deep reinforcement learning is using what is called DPPO, where PPO is proximity uh, uh, optimization. That is a deep reinforcement learning approach uh, that is introduced by uh, has been introduced by Meta Fair a couple of years ago that is the standard platform used for planning but in our case we are at least in this work uh, we are agnostic on the path planner so it's not no that's not uh, I mean you can uh, you can use whatever in theory you can use whatever path uh, planner you want once you have the symbolic map the symbolic represent yeah 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 yeah, in this case, yeah, it takes for it can take. Yeah, here since the sim, yeah, then there are issues uh, with the. Uh, you might have issues with the fact that you would like to have something that is real time. So depending on the and this is actually an open an open problem. 
but in theory, yeah, you can use uh, then. You and this is actually something that in this specific work uh, uh, we try to, the idea of having uh, something that is more symbolic is also to allow traditional model uh, to use what is usually done uh, with the standard set. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And this takes forever, <laughs> obviously, at any time. But yeah, <laughs> okay. But uh, okay, but ev everyone that is working here, everything takes forever. So, but yeah, the, so the problem, yeah, one of the major uh, goal here is to try to do this in, a, I mean, not maybe not really real time, for sure not uh, training time, but at least uh, test time uh, to do this uh, eventually real time. There's no way, yeah, there's no way. The, the, the train, but the test part, the test part could be once you learn the, the the important thing is would be to have this on the same environment or in a similar environment. Yeah, yeah, that's at the very high level. Let's say the the uh, the goal. But even if you do the again, but uh, let's assume then that that we are able somehow to do this uh, again, uh, like we said previously. The problem is that uh, okay, this is probably fancy. I mean, this is uh, hard. There are a lot of complex tasks. Uh, but again, uh, if you try to do, uh, I mean, if you go back to the Roomba scenario, so Roomba is solving a super simple task that is called coverage. So Roomba is just uh, build, I mean, trying to build an optimal path uh, in which uh, it ends up uh, having a map of the entire space uh, in which you are, and the optimality is, is given by the fact that, you, I mean, you cover the entire space uh, in a suboptimal way. So you are not going in the same location uh, a million of times, right? So in that case, the optimality is I would like to cover the entire space uh, as fast as possible. This is the optimality in that case. In our case, the optimality is I would like to find the object uh, to reach the final destination uh, as fast as possible, again, right? But the problem is that even if you can do that, uh, as we said previously, I mean, this is not, uh, in, in, the real, uh, in the real world, uh, this is not going to be a static scene. So you have people animals moving in the same environment. So we would like to do the same uh, having also active agents. And by active agents, uh, I, means, uh, I mean uh, mostly people moving in the same settings. So what we introduce, and this is the main focus of the work that uh, I'm describing now, is to introduce in the same scenario also, uh, so first of all, to provide uh, a data set, a benchmark in which you have also humans moving in the same setting. So social navigation is basically that stuff. So in which we are trying to solve one of the previous tasks. So for example, point goal navigation. So again, the, th the task now is I'm starting from a random position. I want to go in a random location, uh, final destination. But now I have also people that are moving uh, at the same time. And so what I will now, the, po the point is that, OK, I would like to do the same, but I have also to avoid the collision with the person. And in order to do that, so first of all, you need a simulator that is, OK, we have a lot of, of limitations, so this is what these are our humans that are not that realistic. So at the end, are I mean random ob object moving the scene, but at least uh, now you have and we can generate uh, be more or less realistic behaviors uh, such as this one, and you can also control the number of people moving the same settings. So now you have a data set, and this is what we introduced in this in this work, uh, in which you have in the same data set that one of the uh, data set I introduced previously, in particular this HM3D, that is the larger one. Now you have also, and this is our contribution here in terms of data set, we have this large scale HM3DS data set in which you have now 800 training scenes, so buildings, uh, in which you have, uh, uh, I mean, people moving, basically. And this is what we would like to see now. So the green part, now you, these are the fake humans moving in the, I mean, uh, in, this, uh, in this house. Uh, and this is the behavior that you would like to learn, OK? So the robot now, if it sees uh, a person such as this one, cha it is able to change the behavior. And this is actually not a random, this is a real output of our model. In this case, it's working very well. So it is changing the behavior in order to uh, 
basically to avoid collisions. And how uh, how this work uh, how this works? Uh, I'll try to do this super quick. So uh, the baseline, I'm not going into detail. So we are using now a completely data-driven uh, model. We are starting from this model in which, uh, and this is very similar to some of the works that I in introduced previously for trajectory prediction, in which you have a sequence model, like a recurrent neural network, uh, in which now the input, uh, you are learning features from uh, all the different sensors. So you have something like that. So you have CNNs uh, on top of the depth image, uh, RGB, and so on. And you learn a policy in which the features, uh, the input features, are the ones that I just uh, I mean, summarized. And this is our model. So we have basically three components, uh, in which, first of all, we have all the inputs. Then we have, this is basically the state of the art. So state of the art model for uh, uh, object goal navigation and point goal navigation based on uh, all those features, uh, plus an additional, additional features, uh, that we introduced here, that are called uh, proximity features. So basically what we are doing, besides the model itself, uh, is to introduce uh, uh, new features that are somehow able to uh, give the robot uh, a rough estimation of what's happening around the robot itself. And so here in particular we introduce these two feature, features that we call risk value and proximity compass. Uh, that are, I mean, the idea is super simple. So first of all, you have risk value is just a feature in which uh, point-wise uh, we have, uh, I mean, an estimate of uh, the closest uh, person in, uh, in that specific location. While in proximity compass, uh, and this is the picture that is supposed to highlight how this works, uh, now we have a sort of shape context uh, in which for each region uh, we have basically the same information, but that now is taking into account also the, all the, I mean, the, the spatial configuration of all the person moving in the same uh, area. And that is that by using this information, we try to uh, learn a sequence of actions uh, in which now you can also avoid area or settings uh, in which uh, you have something like that. Like in front of you, you have uh, a lot of people, basically. And this is used uh, basically as a source of information for the model in order to learn the optimal policy. So how is this working or not? Uh, well, this works uh, relatively well, but the problem is that in order to, first of all, to evaluate if this is working, uh, we have also to introduce uh, different metrics. Because the problem is that, and this is the last contribution of the work. So besides, again, the model and the data set, uh, we also introduced uh, an evaluation protocol uh, in which we have the same metrics uh, that I introduced previously, so success rate and success uh, uh, weighted by path length. Uh, so these are the standard metrics evaluating if you are reaching the destination in the right way, plus uh, another simple metric that is called human collision, in which now, and this is also I mean, used for evaluation, but also in the policy. So this means that the policy that we are learning is trying also to remove uh, the number of collisions. So human collisions obviously means that uh, I mean you are colliding with some with person. By merging everything all together, uh, this is what you get. So this is the uh, results uh, that we got uh, on comparing with the a simple baseline. Uh, this work is the state of the art model uh, for object goal navigation, point goal navigation. Here are the, all the ablation studies with all the possible configuration in which we are using, uh, let's say, all the previous state-of-the-art models plus uh, the social proximity features that I previously introduced. And here we are evaluating using the standard metrics, uh, so success, ra success rate and SPL, plus obviously human collision, that for the other models, uh, uh, obviously they have no way to use this information, while in our case uh, we, are do I mean, we, we are able to exploit this information and then as you can see this is the I mean this is the method in which we are improving the most. Actually we tried also to understand uh, uh, in which cases uh, the model is working or not and in order to do that uh, we introduced this fine grain evaluation protocol uh, in which now we have additional I mean and here we have also human studies in order to understand if this is really working or not, in which we defined uh, four classes of uh, encounters. So basically, we tried also to understand when, in 
every case, in all the cases in which we have a collision, we try to understand why this is happening. I say, in order to do that, following a similar work in standard robotics, uh, we introduce uh, uh, these four different classes uh, that we call frontal approach, intersection, blind corner, and person following, uh, that are automatically annotated. So what we are doing here is basically, at training time, uh, we are observing uh, the locations of the robot uh, with respect to the other uh, persons moving. So if the trajectories are more or less going uh, against each other, then this is frontal approach. This is intersection, this is blind corner, that obviously is the, mo uh, the most challenging one, and this is person following. So by doing that, uh, then uh, we, will, we are also able uh, to understand uh, when we have problems, so collisions, uh, what is the ma major cause for, the, for, for that. And then we introduce also metrics in order to evaluate this. So these are the new metrics that we introduce in the fine grain evaluation that are basically measuring uh, quantitatively these behaviors. So number of encounters, so how many encounters are happening, uh, what we call encounter sur uh, survival rate, so basically the rate of uh, encounters in which you have no collision, and then uh, the velocity and the distance uh, when you collide. I'm done. Let's keep this. Uh, and this is what you get, basically. So the nice thing, uh, so this is an example. Uh, you have to watch this multiple times to understand what's happening. But uh, again, here uh, you have, uh, I mean, the red uh, trajectories are trajectories of persons moving, right? The blue one uh, is our model. So as you can see, this is the policy. Th this is a real example. So this is what the robot is doing. So it's not, I mean, at the beginning is exploring, uh, so it's navigating. Uh, then at a certain point uh, it moves uh, and is able to avoid the collisions and to reach the final destination that is here. This is a suboptimal, as you can see here. So this is going, uh, okay, this is working, but is uh, really navigating crazily around uh, the environment. It's going, it's going more or less everywhere. Why the optimal, the green one is the optimal path? but at least it's not colliding. So th that was the major message here. Then uh, you have failure cases uh, such as this one. So the first one is a weird one in which uh, the agent is stuck. So uh, s sometimes uh, probably this is related to the fact uh, uh, that, uh, I mean, the, the visual, uh, uh, the output uh, of the RGB the sensor is not working that well. Uh, and so he's uh, colliding with the, and he's not able to move from there or more interestingly, uh, it might happen something like that. So this is an example in which uh, you have a blind corner. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, so here uh, is going over here, but at a certain point, uh, suddenly you have people coming from here. And going back uh, qualitatively, so this is quantitatively, sorry. So this is another thing uh, uh, that I want to light, then I'm done. Uh, so here you can see the same stuff uh, quantitatively. So here we are, and the nice thing is that you can see for all the different co configuration of the model, you can measure the number of encounters that you have uh, and the different behaviors. And the nice thing is that depending on the models, uh, we observe two major uh, kind of behaviors. The first one is encounter illusion. So in some cases, such as uh, this one, this one, and uh, social task uh, that is here. The model uh, is working relatively well, uh, and the reason why it's working relatively well is that uh, because the model, the policy that you are learning, uh, is keeping the, the, the robot uh, far away from any person. While in the other case, uh, and this is the best one, uh, so here a huge number means that you have a lot of encounters. Then uh, you might treat them in the right way or not. Uh, here we are treating them in the right way because you have large number of, enco uh, of encounters, but uh, the numbers in terms of the metrics that I presented previously, these are the best ones. So this means that you are going uh, maybe close by to the person, but you are able to avoid them. Obviously, this is working well uh, because this means that uh, in the other case, probably in order to avoid person, you are going uh, super far away from the uh, final target and then you are taking a very long path to the final destination. Well, in this case, you can find basically the right trade-off. Okay, I think I'm done. So 
have time for questions if you want uh, and I can go more in details uh, I try to give an overview it's take a while actually